أعوذ بالله السميع العليم من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين آمين I'll read the translation in the name of Allah, the entirely merciful, the specially merciful. <clears throat> All praise is due to Allah, Lord of the worlds, the entirely merciful, the especially merciful. Sovereign of the day of recompense, it is you, we worship and you, we ask for help. Guide us to the straight path, <clears throat> the path of those upon whom you have bestowed favor not of those who have evoked your anger or of those who are astray. Thank you and Salam will, uh, will start the program. Thank you. Thank you, Ashraf. Salam Alaikum. We will start the, uh, the program momentarily. Uh, this is a program that is not being uh, broadcast on social media right now, so we ask that everybody here uh, especially when the students come on stage, do not take pictures of the students, do not post it on social media, and do not take any videos uh, because of the situation that our students are facing today. And that is why we are here, uh, is to defend their freedom of speech, their First Amendment rights, and really to support what they are doing in leading our country as uh, people of conscience against a policy that is not only anti-American, it is anti-human, it is anti-religion, and it is anti-God by supporting a genocide happening today in Gaza. So this is as much a domestic policy, domestic issue conference as it is a foreign uh, policy conference. The First Amendment states, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech, or of the press, or the right of the people peacefully, uh, uh, or the right of the people peaceably to assemble, and to petition the government for redress and grievances. So right here, there are four issues that are of concern in terms of the First Amendment. Number one is the freedom of speech. And if I can say God does not exist, if I can insult God in this country and be protected by the First Amendment, but then I can also say that what the government of Israel is doing is wrong and is a violation of human rights and should be stopped without being called anti-Semitic or without punishment by the government for saying those words. I have the right to dissent against the government, not only because I believe the government is wrong, but because I believe it is my patriotic duty. Patriotism is not following those who just wave the flag when there are times of war. Patriotism is about doing something out of love for your country and love for your fellow people, American people in this country. You have the right to protest because the government should follow the sentiment of the people and when the voices are squelched and they are prevented from being heard in the halls of Congress, then we must hear them from the streets where our students and, uh, and people of conscience are protesting against this government policy. And finally, it is the right of redress, to demand that there's redress by the government when they violate their own laws, the laws that prevents them from sending weapons that are used for, against civilian populations. There are at least six laws, the Leahy Law, the Arms Export Control Act, the Foreign Assistance Act, uh, and so on and so forth, and when they start spying on Americans uh, because they want to continue those policies. Um, it was Abraham Lincoln who said that those who deny the freedom of others do not deserve freedom for themselves especially if we are under a just God. John Foster Dulles, the former Secretary of State, I'm not a fan of his uh, because he led many coups in the Middle East, but he did say one thing that is of, of importance for us to understand today. 
He said, U.S. policy, US policy should not be made in Israel. U.S. policy should be made in America. And he said that by and adding that I should not be called anti-Jewish because I say those words. Martin Luther King said when he was in the Birmingham jail, he said, my fellow uh, moderate friends, he, he was criticizing his white moderate friends, care more about order than they care about justice. So for all these points, today we are discussing Gaza not just as a foreign policy issue and its importance in terms of international humanitarian law and what's happening in the world court, but as a domestic issue in what's happening to Americans uh, who are raising the concern that our country is going in the wrong direction. And many people have protested US policy in the past, in the Vietnam War, the Civil Rights Movement, the Anti-Apartheid Movement. In fact, we had met with a former, assistant, a former Attorney General, Eric Holder, when talking about this issue many years back about student protests, he said, you know, I occupied buildings when I was a student. Errol Southers, the head of public safety at USC and the, board, the uh, president of the Board of uh, Commissions for Los Angeles Police Department said he occupied students when he was a student. So there is nothing, uh, nothing that is so uh, strange or different today what's happening with our student movement because again, they are at the front lines of speaking for conscience. The Reverend Jim, Lawson's, who, Jim uh, Lawson, who just passed away some weeks back, a great civil rights leader, he is the one that trained people under Martin Luther King on civil disobedience. What's interesting about him is that he was a student at Vanderbilt and they kicked him out of Vanderbilt. And he was uh, on his own after that. 20 years later, they brought him back and named a department after Jim Lawson. So our vision is that the students of, the day, of today that are protesting against the US government will be the leaders of America tomorrow. And they will be, inshallah, God willing, in the city council, in the state assembly, in the Congress, uh, as well as leaders uh, for civil society. And that is why we have to defend them today in speaking uh, for our freedom of speech and against genocide in Gaza. So with that, I want to turn to uh, the screen, I want you to turn your attention to the screen. We will show you a video uh, on uh, personal stories of genocide in Gaza. And then we will hear from our first speaker who is an international human rights law expert uh, who, is, who is going to be zooming in uh, from Europe and talking about what's happening in the world court. There is a hell on earth today. Its name is Northern Gaza. We are asking all the civilians in Gaza City to go south of Gaza. Israeli airstrikes have struck Gaza's biggest hospital. Israel has this evening said it struck an ambulance in Gaza City. <laughs> On the 7th of October 2023, the military wing of Hamas led an incursion into southern Israel. It attacked military targets and civilians. Approximately 1,139 Israelis and foreign nationals were killed, some in a counterattack by their own army. Israel responded to the surprise attack immediately with widespread heavy bombing of Gaza. By May 2024, more than 35,000 Palestinians had been killed and nearly 80,000 injured. Thousands more remain buried under the rubble. In its stated aim of destroying Hamas militarily, Israeli forces have gone further than ever before in killing civilians, but also targeting UN facilities and Gaza schools and hospitals. These are normally immune from attack under international humanitarian law, but not in this war. You can't hear yourself think. 
it's not just the noise of the sirens and the strikes. The sound of the chaos in between is just relentless. Pure panic everywhere you look. This little boy was pulled out alive, his face blackened. His rescuer rushes to his mother. But before she can embrace her boy, she passes out in a shock. Anika becomes an ambulance. This woman is driven off before the boot can be shot. We've been told to get out, but where do we go? And how do we get there? There are more than two million people living here. Almost half are children. Families are rushing, trying to make plans. Every second matters. Gaza is under a complete siege. No water, no food, no electricity, and no escape. It's too hard. Some almost give up. But you can't stand still for long. Please, my family, they're just kids. We are not strangers to war, but how it feels this time. It's hard to find the walls. It feels like the world is collapsing. Many are confirmed dead, even more are missing. This woman cannot find her son. I haven't heard from him since Saturday. I haven't heard anything from him, nothing. Here is the family, they're gathering all together, also in a place far away from the wind. I was trying to explain things, but I think you can hear them now. I'm walking right now close to my home, close to my building, but I swear I couldn't recognize the streets. I'm also afraid walking because any minute anything may explode. This afternoon I met Plestia on the street close to where her home once was. Now it's not even safe to walk. Like as you can see here, this building caught a fire as well other than the bombardments that happened. So it's not safe, nothing is safe, literally. Now nothing is recognizable. This is an ambulance. She's afraid of what's happening now and what might happen next. In early June, Al Jazeera aired a series of videos showing Israeli soldiers shooting dead several Palestinians walking near a coastal road in Gaza. This is an excerpt of that report. We're going to begin this news hour with videos emerging out of Gaza appearing to show summary executions of Palestinians by Israeli soldiers. Al Jazeera has obtained the videos, and let me give you a warning, some of you might find them disturbing. We're choosing not to show the moment of death in the videos. They were taken around Al Rashid Street. That's the coastal road connecting North and South Gaza. Israel has designated it as a safe zone for Palestinians wanting to move between the areas. This footage is from June 1st. It shows a person walking along the beach. Israeli soldiers appear to have stopped them, and moments later, the person is shot. This next video is set to show a group of Palestinians walking north on May 17th. One of them steps out of the group and raises their hands in the air, apparently showing that they're unarmed. They're shot within minutes. Then the video appears to show soldiers coming in to take the person's body away. And in this footage, another person is standing in the same area with their hands in the air. This is shortly before they're shot by Israeli soldiers. The same then happens to another person later. In each incident shown in that Al Jazeera report, the Palestinians shot dead by Israeli soldiers appear to be unarmed and are at a distance from the soldiers. 
According to a new investigative article by the Israeli news outlets 972 magazine and Local Call, these executions are consistent with the testimonies of six Israeli soldiers following their release from active duty in Gaza in recent months. The six soldiers describe being authorized to open fire on Palestinians virtually at will. The sources describe the near-total absence of firing regulations in Gaza, with Israeli troops shooting as they please, setting homes ablaze, leaving corpses on the streets, all with their commander's permission. The article's headline, I'm bored, so I shoot, the Israeli army's approval of free-for-all violence in Gaza. We're joined now by the journalist who broke the story, Oren Ziv, is a reporter and photographer for Plus 972 magazine. He's joining us from outside Venice, Italy. Oren, welcome to Democracy Now! I'm bored, so I shoot. First, talk about that Al Jazeera footage that we're seeing, um, the footage that was taken on the coastal road um, uh, in Gaza. And then that quote. Thank you so much for having me. So, first of all, the footage we've just seen from Al Jazeera is aligned with uh, many testimonies we have been hearing from Palestinians over the last month that they're not be able, they're not, they're prevented from going back north. Uh, Palestinians that had to run away or to flee to the southern uh, part of uh, Gaza, as the Israeli army ordered. And this footage is aligned also what we are hearing during our investigation from the six soldiers. Basically, they're saying they had a complete, almost a complete freedom to open fire. So we've been doing researchers and investigation on the past from the attacks from the air using AI and, um, and machine learning. And in this investigation, we talked to soldiers who were deployed during the war in different places and different units on the ground. And what they're saying basically is that whenever they had a slight sense of fear or danger, they could shoot. Nobody would limit them. And even sensitive targets, uh, schools, hospitals, public institutions that officially had, they had to get approval from higher ranks. This was only a bureaucratical step and it was almost always approved. Uh, in addition, one of the soldiers described, and actually two, that in some areas when the Israeli soldiers were deployed in a specific neighborhood inside the Gaza Strip, they would have a red line, a specific point, hundreds of meter, meters from them, that if a Palestinian, even unarmed, even a woman or a child, would cross, they would be allowed to shoot in order to kill, not uh, to arrest, arrest or warn them. Um, and they said that every man between the age of 16 and 50, even in civilian clothes, even unarmed, was considered a fighter or a collaborator with Hamas, and it was allowed to shoot them. And the quote, the headline of your piece in 972 magazine, I'm bored, so I shoot. Yes, so many of the times uh, from our investigation, it seems soldiers were shooting not from a tactical uh, reason or a real military reason, but just out of being bored uh, to pass the time or just because they could. Uh, some of the soldiers spoke to uh, to us about the quote, regular fire, meaning that you shoot. And after you shoot, you say on the army radio that it is normal or regular fire. So other units in the area, and there were many soldiers deployed at the beginning of the war inside the Gaza Strip, will know that this is a shooting by the Israeli army and not by uh, by Hamas fighters. And but they said that this term, regular or normal shooting, was also to kind of uh, state, in other words, I'm just shooting for fun. Uh, one of the soldiers said that in, in Hanukkah, the Jewish holiday of Hanukkah, uh, some of the units in the Gaza Strip talked on the radio to shoot on a certain time to kind of light the sky, and they were just shooting for minutes just for fun. So I think this is one aspect, but it also teaches us that this was a very wide policy. It wasn't just a sporadic uh, uh, problem here and there, but a very wide policy that soldiers felt they can do whatever they want, that they won't be accountable. And all this is done also with the awareness of the commanders. I must add also that because from, from day one of the war, we heard very horrific statements from Netanyahu, from the Prime Minister Netanyahu, from senior ministers in the Israeli government talking about revenge, 
uh, talking about there's no uh, innocent civilians in Gaza. And this went down to the commanders and down to the simple soldiers. And the soldiers that spoke to us in our investigation said that these kind of phrases, there's no innocent people in Gaza, everybody is involved in Hamas. On October 7, they were all celebrating. This is why they need to be punished. was very widely common. And this is why the soldier who spoke to us explained that the acts of vandalism, of uh, looting, of uh, general sense of revenge were very common. Oren Ziv, all but one of the six Israeli soldiers you interviewed spoke on the condition of anonymity. A 26-year-old reservist from Jerusalem named Yuval Green. In November and December, Yuval served in the 55th Paratroopers Brigade. He recently signed a letter by 41 reservists declaring their refusal to fight in Gaza after the Israeli army's invasion of Rafah. Green said, quote, there were no restrictions on ammunition. People were shooting just to relieve the boredom. Well, on Thursday evening, Democracy Now! reached Yuval Green in Jerusalem and asked him what he's calling for now. I believe that continuing this war and continuing the death of, of Palestinians and, and, and Israeli soldiers is not right. I believe that right now, um, the right thing to do is to sign the ceasefire treaty that is going to release the hostages and end this war. I Hamas, know. all other Palestinian groups is a Palestinian matter. What is an international matter, what is a British matter, what is an American matter is Israel, because Washington and London are backers of, of Israel, and Israel, since its inception, has been such a militarized society and state, thinking that by doing more violence, killing more innocent people, you have security. Somebody has got to tell them, and this body has got to be the international system, the international ju judicial system, by killing more people, you will be punished, more innocent people, you will be punished, and that this will not bring you security. What will bring you security is respecting international law, including protecting civilians, and giving up your subjugation and control of the Palestinian people. We, the state of Palestine, have gone to the ICC. We have signed the Rome Statute, and we have said that the International Court of Justice and the International Criminal Court, the ICC, have full jurisdiction over the land of Palestine, the occupied land of the state of Palestine, and should immediately start investigating all war crimes committed in, on our land, from 19, from the year 2014, when Israel killed 1,464 Palestinian civilians, remember in that war, and we wanted so, the ICC so, right. to investigate. Mm -hmm. There is a but, allow me for the but. But who is obstructing us? Who is obstructing us? Only last week, the UK government, the UK government sends an intervention at the ICC saying that Palestine has no jurisdiction. You should not proceed with arresting Netanyahu and Gallant. So the West and the double standards is what obstructing the application of international justice on all parties, not us. Okay. You have concluded that Israel is guilty of attempting genocide. Yes. That's a very heavy charge. Yes. What is the principal reason you say that? The use of very large weapons, 2,000-pound uh, bombs, which are utterly inappropriate in a crowded urban area. A bomb like that can kill somebody two football fields away. Israel has obstructed the delivery of humanitarian assistance to uh, Gaza. And those who have been most severely victimized, young children who are most severely damaged by malnutrition and who will either starve to death or if they survive, uh, they will be diminished uh, for the rest of their lives, diminished physically and psychologically by the severe malnutrition they are enduring as children. And I thought that severe obstruction of the delivery of humanitarian assistance amounted to genocide. As a senior legal officer in the United, in the United Nations and in the International Atomic Energy Agency, she has acquired extensive expertise in the UN's collective peace and security efforts, including peacekeeping, sanctions, counterterrorism, and weapons of mass destruction disarmament. She's the director of MAK Law International and an affiliate of the Harvard Law School Program on International Law and Armed Conflict. She holds a bachelor's in government and a master's in Middle East Studies from Harvard University 
as well as a master's in foreign service and a Juris Doctorate from Georgetown University. You can also uh, listen to her. We have her on our website, Muslim Public Affairs Council. Uh, she did a uh, session for us uh, three years ago uh, on this uh, issue of international law and Palestine. And she is joining us uh, from Vienna, I believe. Uh, hi, Mona. Yes, that's much better. Hi, Mona. Thank, thank you for joining us. I'm calling from Saudi Arabia. Salam. Saudi Arabia. Okay, that's close to Vienna. Um, <laughs> thanks. Thank you for joining us. Yeah, she she is she is all around. Sometimes she's calling me from New York. Uh, always busy. We're so honored uh, to have you, Mona, and um, and and we're looking forward to your remarks, and we'll follow it up with some Q and A afterwards. So, Mona Ali Khalil. Thank you, Salam. Always a pleasure and a privilege to be with you, and a particularly distinct uh, honor to be with the Islamic Center for Southern California this evening, uh, or this morning, wherever you are. Um, so without further ado, um, we, we come together at a very critical juncture in the history of the uh, Palestinian people, but of the, of the globe, in fact. Um, trends uh, with regard to international law are very worrying. The lack of respect for it, the lack of commitment to upholding it, um, is is really quite uh, quite startling and quite uh, disturbing at this uh, this moment. Uh, we are in the midst of what is very likely a genocide in Gaza. The ICJ, the International Court of Justice, has ruled that South Africa's case about Israel's genocidal intent and conduct are plausible, and that the Palestinian people in Gaza have the right to be protected. Uh, not only by Israel, but by the international community at large, given the pillar of the, Gen uh, the Genocide Convention as prevention and not just prohibition or punishment. So it has called upon Israel to stop the killing, stop the maiming, stop the starvation campaign uh, to no uh, real consequence as of now. The ICJ, uh, just a few days ago, uh, determined that Israel's occupation itself in a separate case uh, and the racial discrimination of Martin apartheid uh, is unlawful and that the continued presence of Israel in the OPT in any form must come to an end, that the settlement construction must stop, and that the settlers themselves must be evacuated. In the meantime, the ICC prosecutor has requested that the criminal arrest warrants be issued against the Prime Minister of Israel, the Minister of Defense of Israel, as well as three Hamas leaders on charges including extermination, as well as other war crimes and crimes against humanity. This makes it all the more important that when we speak about what's happening, the atrocities are being committed in Gaza, that we know what we're talking about, that we can distinguish between the separate crimes and the various uh, forms of mass atrocities that are being committed. To that end, I'm honored to be invited to speak to you today about the definition of genocide and particular, and to elaborate further on these recent developments. So the convention itself was adopted by the General Assembly in 1948 and entered into force in 1950. The title of the convention uh, embodies its purpose, the prevention of punishment of the crime of genocide. Particularly interesting about this convention is that in Article 1, it confirms that this is a crime that can be committed not only in times of war, but also in times of peace. It is also distinct in that it has two elements, whereas most criminal instruments talk about the conduct. In this case, you have to prove the intent. Not only the conduct is genocidal, but the intent is genocidal. So it's not just about mass murder. It has to be mass murder with the intention of wiping out, in whole or in part, a particular group, a national group, ethnic group, racial group, or religious group. Not a political group, not an ideological group, but particularly people based on race, nationality, ethnicity, or religion. So, putting these elements together, we end up with a definition as follows. The following acts committed with the intent to destroy, in whole or in part, a national, ethnic, racial, or religious group, including killing, causing serious bodily harm, causing serious mental harm, deliberately inflicting on the group conditions of life calculated to bring about its physical destruction, again in whole or in part, imposing measures intended to prevent births within the group. So this in whole or in part 
means you don't have to succeed in wiping out the group, but that any uh, significant loss of life or for a particular uh, a campaign to end life is sufficient. It is also interesting to note that, as we saw in Ukraine, that the forcible transfer of children of one group to another, from one part of the territory to another, could also be genocidal in intent, in that it is diluting the character, the culture, the identity of the children concerned. Article 3 goes on to, to, to itemize all the different crimes that are related to genocide. So it's not just the commission of genocide, it's the conspiracy to commit genocide. It's the incitement to commit genocide. It's the attempt to commit genocide. And finally, which may be of interest to those in the United States, complicity in the act of genocide. So those who aid and abet, who provide material support to genocide are themselves guilty of the act. Finally, within the definition is also who can be held accountable. We have to distinguish between state responsibility, which is what the International Court of Justice is doing, determining whether the state is committing a genocide, with the individual criminal accountability, which is what the International Criminal Court is doing, where individual leaders, whether they be the Israeli leaders or the Hamas leaders, for their war crimes and their crimes against humanity. As of now, the ICC has not charged anybody with genocide. It has charged both with extermination. The distinction being this question of intent. So mass murder would qualify as extermination, but would not necessarily qualify as genocide without that requisite intent. So what is the historical significance? There is no mystery that the term genocide uh, evolved as a result of the horrific uh, loss of life in the Holocaust with the targeted killing of six million Jews by the Nazi regime. And the Polish lawyer, uh, his name being Raphael Lemkin, is attributed, this definition is attributed to him. Taking the Greek and the Latin uh, origins, genos meaning the race of a tribe, and side meaning killing. So with this, he hoped to establish a separate crime where a group is particularly targeted to be eliminated. And based on, of course, the Nazi Holocaust, but also on other instances, historical instances, where particular groups or tribes uh, were targeted for destruction. Genocide was first recognized as a crime in a resolution, and then became part of the convention that we spoke about, which is now, uh, which now has over 150 states parties to the convention. But yet another unique um no, I shouldn't say unique because it also applies to torture and slavery and a few other things. But these instruments are of such universal um, and binding international character that they apply to everybody whether or not they're a party. This is a very important thing. States that are not party to the Genocide Convention, and just doing the math is 193 member states and only 150 states parties, that means there's 40 odd states that have not signed the Genocide Convention. They too are equally bound because this is a customary international law instrument, what they call Jews' Cogent's principles with their bill on this obligations, meaning everybody is bound and everybody is protected, regardless of whether the state concern is a party. So this is huge. And this also creates what is known as universal jurisdiction, meaning not only the international courts have jurisdiction, but any national court has jurisdiction. So if any of these indicted individuals, uh, well, not yet indicted in terms of the arrest warrants that need to be issued, the charged individuals could be tried in any country that recognizes universal jurisdiction. Belgium is a famous one. If we remember when Sharon, many, many years ago, some of you may not have been born, was, was afraid to travel because Belgium uh, uh, law allows them to capture anybody who is charged with a universal crime. And what happened in Sabrachatila, for instance, would qualify the session. There was that, I don't, I don't want to say legislation, but there was existing laws that would have allowed persons to bring a case against him traveling to or through Belgium. Um, and the same will now apply to Netanyahu and to Yolande, as well as the Hamas leaders who have been charged 
and others, of course, because these are universal crimes, but these are the ones that happen to be indicted by the International Criminal Court. So when we talk about the definition in the Genocide Convention, it's important to recognize that the, it is also a crime under the Rome Statute from the International Criminal Court, as well as part of the responsibility to protect, where states parties as well as member states of the UN, as well as the Security Council of the United Nations have the affirmative duty, the responsibility, to act when civilians are facing one of four crimes, genocide being the first, or crimes, crimes, crimes against humanity and ethnic cleansing. So, indeed, you know, genocide is relevant across all of these different legal uh, principles and legal uh, doctrines. Just checking the time to make sure that I don't go over my time. Um, so, as we said earlier, the intent is the most difficult part to, to determine. And as such, it's always very, very, um, very well, the member states are very hesitant to use the term. The Secretary General is very hesitant to use the term because it's hard to establish the intent. But in this case, the statements are such, and we'll see shortly when we talk about the particular case in Gaza, are such that there is ample um, reference points that one can make regarding the intent of the leaders as well as the people, Hipster, meaning military leaders, political leaders, and the actual soldiers. Uh, so this is something that is relatively unique. You know, we have the what many are calling the first televised genocide that we have, you know, admissions, confessions being made, you know, uh, with, with TikTok videos from the soldiers themselves proclaiming their intent to wipe out uh, the Palestinians in Gaza, proclaiming their desire to see everybody dead. So these are rather unique elements, but we'll get, we'll get to those specifics uh, uh, very shortly. So again, it's uh, very important to understand that when we're talking about genocide, we're talking about national, ethnic, racial, and religious. We're not talking about a particular political group, political ideology, a particular, in this case, uh, terrorist group that's being targeted, targeted according to the Israeli officials. We're talking about a people being wiped out. So how does this apply to the current crisis? As we said, um, the ICJ has ruled that the claim of genocide is plausible. The actual determination will come much later when they've looked at all of the uh, submissions by all of the different sides. But as of now, what we know is, and this is in large part based on Israeli reporting, um, to their credit, the Israeli papers have done more to expose the truth about what happened and what is happening um, uh, than, than, than I would say the Western media has. So on October 7th, we know that Hamas launched a very bloody attack in southern Israel. According to Israel's latest count, and this is Israel's count, 685 Israeli civilians, 373 members of the Israeli security and military forces, and 71 foreigners were killed as a result of that attack, as well as a result of the Israeli security forces' response to it. Clear cases of friendly fire responsible for some of the losses of the uh, civilians uh, that were killed. Hamas and other militant groups also took 240 hostages, of which more than 100 were released in the fall of 2023 through a negotiated deal. And since then, the Netanyahu government, one of the most extreme, if not the most extreme in the history of the state of Israel, have waged a vengeful war on Gaza. Uh, one would argue a pretextual war in order to reclaim Gaza and possibly a genocidal war against the entire population without regard to civilian versus combatant, in which anywhere between 50 to the Lancet now says 180,000 uh, may have been killed, largely children and women, uh, somewhere between 15 and 20,000 children that we know of, not counting those that are missing, not counting those that are under the rubble. These figures are astronomical. They are uh, known to be greater than the losses in multiple years of other similar um, conflicts uh, in the 20th, the 21st century. This is not counting the hundreds of thousands who have been wounded, the, the disproportionate number of amputations and missing limbs as a result of the maiming that is happening, that 2.2 million Palestinians have been displaced, not once, not twice, but in some cases, lots of times, that thousands of homes and hundreds of schools and hospitals have been targeted um, 
And that the blockade, which has been uh, in place for more than 17 years already, he has now become a full-fledged uh, siege as of October 7th, with no food, no water, no fuel, no electricity, for more than nine months, leading to what we now know international organizations have confirmed is an ongoing famine. Another cause for widespread death and, uh, and disease. Now, this brings us to the case brought by South Africa. Um, I, I wish to recall Nelson Mandela, who, upon the uh, liberation of South Africa from the apartheid regime, declared in his speech on the uh, commemoration of the International Day of Solidarity with the Palestinian people, he said, and I quote, that we know too well, we being the South Africans in this quote, that our freedom is incomplete without the freedom of the Palestinians. 26 years later, almost to the day, South Africa lodged a case in the International Court of Justice alleging that Israel's military operations and collective punishment of the entire civilian population of Gaza in response to the October 7 attack are genocidal in both intent and conduct. Within two weeks, the court had its hearings and ordered Israel to stop killing Palestinians in Gaza after finding that South Africa's allegations were plausible and declaring that the need to protect Palestinians and to prevent the genocide of the Palestinians procured this plausible. And that is the key. You don't have to wait till the genocide is over in order to uh, fulfill the provisions of the convention. The court will, of course, in due time, hear the full merits of the case, giving all sides, uh, uh, including the Israeli side, the opportunity to present their case. And given that this will take in some cases, many years, it's important that these preventive and provisional measures be respected. Uh, and the court has three times now issued these provisional measures. The first, in the first instance in January, then again in March, and then again most recently in May as a result of the operations in Rafa. So in assessing the plausibility of the genocidal nature of Israel's actions and intentions, the court cited uh, multiple UN reports, including from the Secretary General, including from UNRWA, uh, including from UNICEF, including from the several UN sources, regarding the devastating consequences of Israel's military campaign, the catastrophic impact on the entire population, a huge toll on Palestinian children, the collapse of the humanitarian system, and the math that anticipated from the calculated starvation campaign being waged. The court also referred to the genocidal statements by senior Israeli leaders, including the president of Israel, claiming that there are no uninvolved civilians, meaning no innocent civilians, and holding the entire nation responsible for the Hamas attack. The prime minister, the Chenyahu, quoted biblical references to the Amalek, which were understood by the soldiers and repeated by the soldiers as a call for revenge against all Palestinians, in particular men, women, and infants. The court also cited dehumanizing statements by the Israeli Minister of Defense, referring to fighting human animals and ordering a complete siege of Gaza with no food, no fuel, no electricity. In upholding South Africa's right to bring the case, as well as the right of the Palestinians in Gaza to be protected from genocide and related prohibited acts, the court basically declared that Israel is conducting what amounts to a genocide. Citing the extreme vulnerability of Gaza's civilian population and the Prime Minister of Israel's statements that the war will take many more months, the ICJ noted the urgency of the situation pending its definitive conclusion on the occurrence of a genocide, that there is a real and imminent risk that irreparable prejudice will be caused. Accordingly, by an overwhelming majority, 15 judges ordered Israel to take these provisional measures uh, to prevent acts of genocide, to prevent the incitement of genocide, to ensure humanitarian assistance, and to preserve the evidence so that the larger case can be held with the benefit of the existing evidence. Finally, the court emphasized that all parties to the conflict, meaning not only Israel, but Hamas and the militant groups, are bound by international law and confirmed that the orders it was issuing were legally binding on Israel. It also called upon the Hamas to release the hostages. 
which had been abducted and were being held in captivity. The difference here being that there's a slight nuance in that the court is about states, and Hamas is not a state or a state actor, it's a non-state actor. And therefore, the court's jurisdiction over non-state actors is uh, diminished. The same with the Rohingya in Myanmar. Um, uh, so the, the court can call upon states, uh, but it can confirm the obligations of non-states. But it cannot call upon Hamas the same way it calls upon the state, which is the subject of jurisdiction. So these are the nuances. I mean, many people made a big deal out of the fact that they did not call for a ceasefire. But a ceasefire is two parties. You can't call on one party to a ceasefire and the other. And therefore, the, the fact that the court didn't call for it is purely a matter of law and not disrupting of, um, a, a lack of uh, concurrence with the request that there be, with the demand by the international community, by the UN, by the Security Council, that there be a ceasefire. So since that initial order, as we said, there's been multiple orders, um, some humanitarian in nature, others falling upon, including the seizing of the operation in Rafa. Um, but let's not, before we end the definition, let's not forget about the complicity, which is the fifth element of the of the crime of genocide. And for states who are complicit in Israel's genocide, they're not only failing to fulfill their obligation to prevent Israel's genocide, but they are actively aiding and abetting that genocide. Thus, even if Israel's leaders ignore the court's workers, Israel's allies, the U.S. included, should reconsider their unconditional military, financial, and diplomatic support to the war in Gaza, unless they're willing to be complicit with what the world court has deemed to be plausible acts of genocide. The United States and the United Kingdom and Germany, to a degree, as well as others, may wish to heed their ruling and the orders of the UN's highest judicial tribunal. This will be tested in a case by Nicaragua, which has been brought against Germany, which is probably uh, providing spare parts so far as has been revealed and uh, not really providing such big weapons the way the U.S. is with the 2,000 pound bombs and the billions and billions of dollars of support. So it's probably uh, the less compelling case of complicity, but it's the possible case because Germany has recognized the jurisdiction of the court on a permanent basis, whereas the U.S. has not. So these are the major developments as far as the International Court of Justice is concerned. The International Criminal Court is a parallel uh, court. Um, one is a UN court, one is a court established by states parties. The ICC, the International Criminal Court, is in the process of considering a request by the prosecutor for uh, warrants against, as we said earlier, Netanyahu and Galant but also against three Israel, uh, three Hamas leaders, including Yahya Sinwar and Ismail Haneya. Um, the, the charges against these five, the charges against the Hamas leaders include war crimes and crimes against humanity, including extermination, murder, taking hostages, raid, torture, and cruel treatment and captivity. The charges against uh, Netanyahu and Gallant also war crimes, crimes against humanity, include extermination, the intentional direct attacks against the civilian population, the willful killing and murder, the willful causing of great suffering and serious injury to the body and health, starvation as a method of warfare, and persecution as well as cruel treatment. This does not preclude the prosecutor from adding charges as the investigation continues, but thus far he's confident that these charges can be defended in court and has invited the judges of the trial chamber to issue the arrest warrants. Those uh, uh, warrants are pending. Tremendous pressure, of course, is being put on the court uh, with disregard to the independence of the court and the international character and impartiality of the court to cease and desist from these considerations. Now, let's keep in mind, before we uh, end the uh, brief introductions, or maybe not so brief after all, um, but I'm checking my time, and I think I'm still within the time um, that there is other crimes, as we see from the International Criminal Court. So if ultimately genocide is not proven uh, because of this intent issue, we can still point, of course, to the occupation, the settlements, the apartheid, the, uh, the uh, extrajudicial executions, the forcible displacement, the, set the settlers... Uh, using weapons given to them by the government to kill and to confiscate homes in the West Bank, 
but thousands of Palestinians, including hundreds of children who are being held without a charge or trial. We're talking about the uh, interference with humanitarian assistance, the construction of settlements, the parading of Simi Nekit Ben uh, in a degrading and humiliating manner, violation of the torture convention. There's a uh, series of lies that were told in order to fuel and, and, and purportedly justify these, the, the mass atrocities committed in, in Gaza. Everything from beheaded babies to oven roasted babies, truly horrific concoctions of, of, of very, I would say, sick minds in order to propel uh, a, a question-free campaign in Gaza. The taking of lines of an unprecedented number of UNRWA and UN staff and journalists, international journalists, as well as local Palestinian journalists. The use of starvation as a weapon of war. Willful destruction of hospitals, schools, churches, mosques, universities, on an unprecedented scale with absolute blatant disregard for the sanctity of these uh, facilities. And last but not least, as the as the court uh, in the advisory opinion ruled, the racial discrimination that, uh, that defines the Israeli practices of the occupied territories. So where is the United States in all of this? The U.S. has been sending 2,000 pound bombs for reduce in densely populated areas by definition, an indiscriminate weapon, sending billions of additional dollars for a political sort of, uh, support bilaterally and multilaterally using the veto in the Security Council and suppressing peaceful protests at home. The U.S. courts, at least one in California, which has been upheld by the appeals level, has ruled that while these questions are not within the jurisdiction of the court system, that nonetheless there is evidence and the courts have expressed sympathy with the claim that genocide is being committed. This is rather significant, especially in light of the fact that 40% of Americans, including 56% of Democrats, believe that Israel is committing a genocide in Gaza. This also is part of a larger picture where 70% of voters are in support of a permanent ceasefire, including 83% of Democrats, 65% of independents, and 56% of Republicans, meaning a majority of all three political blocs. The source of this data is the data for progress. So in conclusion, for all of those who seek peace, justice, security, and equal humanity, the recent actions by the International Court of Justice and the ICC prosecutor regarding Israel's ongoing crimes really ends and upends decades of Israel's impunity for its many crimes against Palestine and Palestinians. The work of the ICJ and the ICC has answered the call of the millions of Jews, Christians, Muslims worldwide who are marching for ceasefire and upholding the maxim that never again means never again for anyone. We are not only free to speak what is happening in Gaza, we are obliged to do so as a matter of law, as a matter of principle, and as a matter of chief matter. So I'm ideal to court. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mona, for that exquisite, insightful um, explanation of, uh, of what's happening in the international courts. Uh, I think everybody here is, is now more educated uh, on the issue, and they don't have to pay tuition. Uh, for this <laughs> crash course and probably know more about international humanitarian law than a lot of uh, lawyers in this country, uh, even though we have two good lawyers here with us today. Uh, and um, I, 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 uh, I've had a lot of questions already come up uh, on, uh, and here's the first one. Um, how do you refute the popular claim that it's not genocide because if Israel wanted to wipe out all the people in Gaza, it would have done so already. So it's a question of numbers, a uh, question of percentage of the population um, a as a, re uh, a rebuttal to this issue of genocide. Well, I mean, the, the answer lies in the very basic elements of the definition of genocide, which is you don't have to wipe out everybody in order to be guilty of genocide. In whole or in part means exactly that. And a part of the group that is uh, uh, decimated, when they intend to destroy that group, 
is sufficient to satisfy the definition. That part is not the difficult part, it's the intent part. But thanks to the Israeli leaders and Israeli soldiers, it becomes easier and easier to prove the intent because they themselves are demonstrating very publicly and very blatantly what they hope to achieve. Okay. Um, so the numbers are quite massive, actually. When we're talking about Ukraine, which is decried by the West as being one of the most horrific and most uh, uh, cruel uh, military campaigns, and, and every civilian life is, is, a, is, a, is a sacred life. I don't mean to, the comparison is not meant in any way to dismiss the trauma and the, the crimes that are being committed in the Ukraine. But after nearly you know two and a half years of war in, in, um, in Ukraine, the number of civilian losses is a fraction of the number of civilian losses in Gaza in a much, much shorter period. We're talking eight to nine months. So that alone should expose the double standards of the West in terms of how they approach the subject. Um, so if 50,000 is not enough, I don't know what is. Do we have to wait till it's 180,000 as the Lancet predicts? Exactly, right. Do we have to wait till the numbers of the famine take toll and it's even greater, 500,000? The whole point of genocide is to prevent it, that the horrors of the Holocaust should never be repeated against anyone. And certainly not by those who are using the legacy of the Holocaust to justify their crimes. Thank you. Um, uh, other questions deal with the teeth um, that uh, need to be uh, applied when it comes to decisions or, or declarations by the International Criminal Court or the International Court of Justice. Um, They've made declarations to protect Palestinians, but what can, when can we see some enforcement or action to stop the genocide? Uh, the uh, the provisional measures are directed to the Israeli uh, government and Israeli leaders. As we said, genocide is also not just leaders, not just the states and the leaders, but could also be private individuals who are committing or inciting um, uh, these crimes. The, uh, the Security Council, under the charter of the UN system, is uh, the mechanism to which the international community looks to enforce the law in general, the resolutions of the Security Council, as well as the judgments of the International Court of Justice. And the provisional measures are decisions, as the court itself has said, are decisions that are binding on the state concerned, and the Security Council should be enforcing that. Now, several member states have called upon the Security Council to take this action. The history in this case, the practice of the Council has been very weak. So it hasn't taken action in this case, but it hasn't taken action on any other case either, with one exception, I believe. Um, and it was with the consent of the country concerned, so it's not really a true precedent because it was with the cooperation of a change of government in the same state. Um, so that is a very weak record of the Security Council, in part driven by the veto of the permanent members of the Security Council, but in part uh, as a result of the lack of push by the other members. So, I mean, we need to encourage the other members to push for this um, and at least uh, name and shame those who are blocking that effort. But as of now, you don't really have much. Um, I think Algeria, when it was a member of the Security Council, I believe it might still be for a few more months, um, has, was one of the few that has invoked um, the, the relevant article of the charter that, that would in, uh, cause for the enforcement of the uh, provisional measures of the Security Council, of the International Court of Justice, forgive me. Now, some will argue that provisional measures are not the final decision. But nonetheless, the court itself has answered that question by reminding everybody that these are binding obligations. So while they're preliminary, pending the ultimate case, that the order to stop killing, to stop inciting, and to stop starving are binding on Israel. So should be susceptible to enforcement by the Security Council, should the political will be there. Thank you. Uh, next question is, wasn't Friday's ruling a determination that Israel is an apartheid state and therefore Hamas isn't in violation, especially because Israel doesn't recognize Palestine, so Hamas cannot be charged? Mm -hmm. I mean, there's two elements to what you're saying. Um, the, the court did not use the word apartheid. It did confirm that racial discrimination 
of the magnitude of violating multiple instruments against uh, um, you know, the, the basic human rights instruments, as well as the specific uh, elimination of racial discrimination instruments have been violated, patently violated, but it did not itself use the word apartheid. Um, and I mean, it could have, obviously, but apartheid is a criminal um, act that uh, is, is found in the Rome Statute. Um, and uh, so what, what their reasons are for refraining from using that particular term while nonetheless confirming the mass of racial discrimination that underlies the Israeli practices of the LPT remains to be seen. I, I, I haven't read the um, the dissents and the, there's long dissent and there's several clarifying statements and reservations and uh, um, separate opinions. Uh, so the, the answer may be in there. Uh, the second thing that you said uh, about Hamas not being, not, not to the extent that Israel doesn't recognize Palestine as a state, at the end of the day, it's not Israel's recognition or lack of recognition that determines the obligations. International humanitarian law applies to both state and non-state actors. Nobody accepts Hamas as the government of the Palestinians or even as a representative of the Palestinians. Uh, for better or worse, it's the Palestinian Authority, which was elected many, many moons ago and has long outgrown and outlived its the legitimacy of its election. But nonetheless, it is the sitting government recognized by the international community. And until there's a subsequent election, the Palestinian Authority is a representative of the Palestinian people. Regardless, state and non-state actors are bound by international humanitarian law, so the war crimes and crimes against humanity are applicable to Hamas. And uh, the second element of that is, even if, as we say, Israel has a right to self-defense, there are limits on that self-defense. The same way, even if Hamas has the right of national resistance against foreign occupation, there are limits on that right. So both sides claiming an absolute uh, impunity because they're supposedly acting in self-defense or in the parallel self-defense of an occupied people, which is of the right of national resistance. Both of those things are protected under international law, but both of those things are subject equally to the limits on the use of force against civilians and against civilian objects, and both are in violation of that. Okay. Now, to the extent that there are criminal charges, each of those individuals who was charged has their day in court. And I would encourage them to surrender and to present their case in court that they were acting in accordance with those rules, that they were targeting military, that they were uh, presenting um, uh, cautionary measures to protect civilians, and, let, and let, their, let them have their day in court, which is more than they're giving for the people on the ground who are uh, being subjected to a collective punishment without any due process, without any presentation of any distinction between civilians and combatants. So the court will provide two protections. It provides due process, the opportunity to present your case. It also takes away the death penalty, which if I were one of the Hamas leaders, I would surrender. I would at least be protected from the assassination attempts and I would have the opportunity to present my case and the righteousness of my cause and would face accountability for any crimes committed, including the taking of hostages, including the use of force against civilians. So if we want to apply international law, we have to hold both sides accountable. And nobody by saying that is saying that the crimes of Israel are equal to the crimes of Hamas. No, but they're equally guilty of crimes. The number of crimes is far greater on the Israeli side. The, uh, the frequency of crimes is far greater on the Israeli side. The gravity and the consequence of the crimes is far greater on the Israeli side. But that does not mean that Hamas did not commit crimes on October 7th. And, and, and further, the continued holding of hostages, including elderly and children, is itself crime. So we, we need to, if we're going to uphold it, we have to make sure that we uphold it in the interest of, of, of uh, the truth as well. Our own religion requires that we do not lose sight of the truth in our defense of our side or in our condemnation of our enemies. The truth must prevail, and our faithfulness to the truth must prevail. Thank you, Riyas. And, and further to that point, our religion says, even when there's animosity from, this, from the other side, it should never allow us to deviate from justice. So we should, exactly. we should apply justice regardless. Um, uh, turning our attention to the United States, uh, Senator Lindsey Graham 
complained that if we uh, recognize the international court, it's Israel today and they'll come after the United States tomorrow. Uh, how feasible is that? How it, Was he just playing politics or is there any, uh, a, a, any uh, foundation to this notion that U.S. leaders will be guilty of complicity uh, in war crimes uh, in this situation and, and, and guilty of war crimes in terms of what happened in the past in Iraq, Afghanistan, and other places? Okay. Uh, it's an interesting point um, because let's go a little bit into the history. When the uh, statute, the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court was adopted, it was open for signature. Um, at the very last minute of the deadline for that open for signature, was, which is usually the first step of, of showing uh, international support for a particular international instrument, the U.S. and Israel signed the Rome Statute, both both of them, at different times, but did the approximately the, around the same time, near the end of that open for signature period. And it was uh, President Clinton who signed on behalf of the United States, uh, of the Rome Statue. Soon thereafter, President George W. Bush became the president and purported to undo that signature. And how do you do that legally? There is a way to actually do it. Um, while you can never erase that it was signed by the U.S., what you can do is disavow that signature by saying, our country has no interest and no intention of ever ratifying this convention which for it to become a party is required. You can't just sign it. You have to sign it and ratify it or accede to it. So by saying that they have no intention ever, ever, ever of signing it, they have un of, of ratifying it, they have in effect unsigned it. But Israel has never done that. Israel did not disavow their signature the way that the U.S. has disavowed its signature. Now, that does not make it a party, so it is not effectively bound by the Rome Statute. But Israel is bound by an obligation of good faith not to defeat the objects and purposes under Rome statute. As long as it is a signatory, it has that obligation. So that distinguishes the U.S., which no longer has that obligation, that good faith obligation, because it has declared its intent to disavow the signature. Israel has not, and therefore it has that set of obligations of good faith that the U.S. does not. In addition... The reason Israel is subject to the jurisdiction of the ICC in this case is because of crimes committed on the territory of, of, the, of the state of Palestine. So to the same extent the state of Israel is recognized by the international community in its pre-67 borders, the state of Palestine, consisting of the other side of that border, which is the West Bank, Gaza, and East Jerusalem, is recognized as the state of Palestine. To the extent that the state of Palestine is a party, to the Rome Statute, anything that happens on its territory becomes it within the jurisdiction of the court. And this has been confirmed by the trial chambers. Now, whether or not they will actually proceed to issue the warrants on such high-level leaders remains to be seen. But we have seen arrest warrants issued against other heads of state, including the, head of state, the former head of state of Sudan, uh, as well as the former head of state of Libya and the whole former head of state of uh, Cote d'Ivoire. So there are precedents for heads of state. Of course, the ICTY also had Milosevic as a former head of state and Charles Taylor in the uh, court for uh, Sierra Leone. Um, uh, so there's plenty of precedents for heads of state, much less a head of government like Netanyahu or a minister of defense like Lech Galang. So it's not unprecedented at all to go after you know senior leaders of government. We have their, their precedents. Um, but here, to the extent that Israel is not a party, we have these two distinguishing features. So the U.S. could, in fact, uh, be uh, accused of complicity with very clear substantiative evidence. Now, whether the court would have jurisdiction is not as likely as Israel. But even if what Lindsey Graham is saying is true, um, uh, and I wouldn't apply to what happened in uh, uh, before, for instance, before what before Palestine became a party or before Afghanistan became a party. The prior uh, prosecutor of the International Criminal Court had, in fact, opened an investigation into criminal behavior by American soldiers in Afghanistan. Um, now, so that's, that's one layer. 
the events before that those countries or those territories have become uh, part of the jurisdiction of the court would, would not apply. The second element is the complementarity, and this applies to any state party to the statute, as well as to Israel, as well as the United States, the, this principle of complementarity. So if a crime is identified and is tried by the country concerned, then the ICC has no jurisdiction. So the best way to guarantee that the ICC doesn't uh, exercise jurisdiction is to try those people yourself, have a meaningful, that has to be willing and able to conduct a meaningful investigational prosecution within the national system. So if the country were to try, as, as the Sudanese, for instance, wanted to try Bashir uh, 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 in, in the Sudanese courts, as the Libyans, uh, the, the post-war government, wanted to try not only um, Qaddafi, but Qaddafi's son, Saif Islam, and there's a back and forth between the court and the country trying to establish that they have the willingness and the ability not only to prosecute, but also to accord minimum human rights protections, minimum due process protections that belong to the defendant so that they have rights that they are not, you know, banana, uh, banana court, you know, whatever the terminology is, that it's an actual meaningful uh, 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 prosecution with minimum human rights protection, the, the, the internationally required human rights protections. Uh, so all of that, you know, obviously the U.S. would be able to do a military court martial or a regular uh, criminal prosecution in order to evade any prosecution. But if you call for the law to apply to Putin, you then you must call for the law to apply to everybody else. <laughs> Otherwise, your call, you know, and, and this is not in any way to absolve Putin for his many war crimes, including the what the Nuremberg Tribunal called the crime of all crimes, which is the crime of aggression. Uh, so the, the, the fact that both sides are guilty of potential crimes does not obviate the guilt of one or the other. I, we have a duty to call them all out. Thank you very much. Yeah, no, that's excellent. Thank you very much, Muna. Um, this was very educational um, and insightful, and I think your analysis uh, is crystal clear. Uh, and inshallah, someday we'll, we'll see you up there as one of our uh, judges uh, in the international court to uphold the rule of law. That's very kind. That's a very, very huge vote of confidence that I... Uh, you may not have heard, but they gave you a gratitude. rounding applause. I don't know if you heard it, Mona, but they gave you a rounding applause after I said that. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you. It's my honor. It's my privilege. And uh, any time... Um, that you need me, just call on me. I'm here. Thank you. Thank you, so much. Thank you Islamic Senator from Southern California. And thank you, everybody who is uh, willing to. Thank you. Um, I, have, uh, I have one announcement. Uh, eight months ago, we called on President Biden to step down from re-election because of what he did in enabling, protecting, funding genocide. Uh, and today he stepped down. So... <laughs> So, and I think uh, a lot of it has to do with uh, those of us here and the students who stood up in protest against this policy. And it shows that no matter what we think, you know, in terms of, you know, how ho hopeless the situation is and, and how drastic uh, the factors are against us, um, if we keep working, uh, we will make it clear that we will not allow any government official to continue to serve uh, if he's not abiding by the principles. Uh, of humanity, uh, as well as the, uh, of, of the Constitution itself. So he has stepped down today, uh, and now it's about <laughs> looking for candidates. And I know there are some people here who are running for Congress, running for State Assembly. You can meet, we cannot endorse them, uh, but they are now, uh, there are several candidates now that, uh, and I've never seen this before, 20 years ago, we never thought it would happen, but they are now on the plank in supporting Palestine, Palestinian human rights, and ending the genocide uh, in Gaza. So it's, a, it's a still a small step, but it's an important step.